Hello, everyone, and welcome to this online session. My name is Susie Savidu, and I'm the head of the psychology department at City College, University of York Europe campus. I'm delighted to host this session today, presented in collaboration with City College, University of York uh, Europe campus. We will be hearing my colleague Kayopi Megari today, lecturer and academic director of the postgraduate program in clinical psychology at City College, University of York, Europe campus. And she is also a postdoctoral researcher at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Today, Kayopi is going to explore the question Is there a connection between the heart and the brain? which is the source, of, the source of emotions. For example, when we are in love or when we feel our heart break uh, out of sadness, which organ handles this? Are all emotions located in the brain or in the heart? Without any further uh, ado, please allow me to hand over to Calliope to explore these questions. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Dr. Savidu, for the, for the introduction. Uh, I will share my slides now and try to answer all these questions and the interesting things that I did in my research. Um, I will speak about brain and heart, their dynamic connection. But before I start, let me introduce myself, my city, and my, uh, and, and my college. I am Dr. Kaliop Megari, Academic Director of Postgraduate Program in Clinical Psychology, City College, University of York, Europe Campus. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Lab of Cognitive Neuroscience, School of Psychology, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. I'm the head of the Center of Creative Activities of Children with Disabilities, Municipality of Calamaria in Thessaloniki, Greece. I'm the leader of rehabilitation of COVID-19 patients working group of NeuroCOVID of International Neuropsychological Society. I'm editor-in-chief of Psychiatry and Mental Health Journal. And I'm general secretary of board of directors and ethics committee president of Hellenic Neuropsychological Society. And I'm a member of a, pub of a public interest advisory committee, diversity committee of American Psychological Association. Now, let me introduce my city, Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is the second largest city in Greece. Its name is the co-capital, a reference to its historical status or co-reigning city of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire alongside Constantinople. Thessaloniki is Greece's second major economic, industrial, commercial, and political center. It's a major transportation hub for Greece, and southeastern Europe, notably through the port of Thessaloniki. The city is renowned for its festivals, events, and vibrant cultural life in general, and is considered to be Greece's cultural capital. This is my city, Thessaloniki. You should come when you have the chance. It's a beautiful city. And these are the historical monuments of the city, which are by the sea. And now City College. City College, University of York, Europe campus, offers a range of undergraduate and postgraduate programs in the fields of business studies, computer science, psychology, and humanities in the region of Southeast and Eastern Europe. The majority of the programs are offered at City College's main campus in Thessaloniki, Greece, while a number of programs are also offered in other locations across the region. The psychology department of City College, University of York, Europe campus has excellent reputation due to the high quality of teaching and research. Our academic staff is strongly committed to excellence in research and in teaching at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. This is City College. We are located in the center of the city of Thessaloniki. And now a few things about clinical psychology uh, master of science program the mode of delivery classes take place on weekday evenings and the language of instruction is english now the heart i love you so much of my heart that none is left to protest this is some uh, something that said uh, by william shakespeare a hero of uh, his uh, uh, scenario much ado about nothing Beatrice said about said this 
I love you. Is that a statement, purely a statement of cognitive thought or simply heartfelt emotion, a mix of both, or one is indistinguishable from, from the other? The scientific study of the heart and brain began with Greek philosophers and extends to neuropsychology and psychocardiology. Patients with heart disease often suffer from psychological comorbidities in addition to various physical impairments. These mental disorders reduce the quality of life and have a negative effect on the development and the course of heart diseases. When we are in love or when we feel that our hearts can break out of sadness, which organ can handle our emotions? Heart beats at a different rate uh, be, be, uh, depending on the emotions that we feel, but it's the brain has a control. Heart and brain have a dynamic relationship with a strong connection that includes an, a lot of, of different conditions. Heart injury leads to dysfunction of the brain with cognitive impairments. Communication between the heart and brain actually is a dynamic ongoing two-way dialogue with each organ continuously influencing the other's function. Research has shown that the heart communicates to the brain in four major ways, neuro neurologically, through the tra transmission of nerve impulses, biochemically, uh, via hormones and neurotransmitters, biophysically, through pressure waves, and energetically, through electromagnetic field, inter field interaction. Communication along all these conduits significantly affects the brain's activity. The heart is both the source of life and the source of cardiac arrhythmias and complications. Cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of morbidity and mortality all around the world. Cardiovascular systems is regulated by the autonom autonomic nervous system, which includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerv nervous systems with emotions and feelings. Cardiovascular diseases are connected to subtle brain dysfunction changes and alterations in neurocognitive performance that assesses stroke and dementia. Stressful life events impact on both the heart and the brain, and lifestyle interventions may be, may be beneficial on the diseases of the cardiovascular systems and brain. Now, let me int introduce my research that shows the dynamic connection between heart and brain and supports this idea. Uh, my research is, uh, is done in Achiappa University General Hospital, which was the first reference hospital for COVID-19 patients as well. This is Achiappa University Hospital, and this is me working at the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. We, for, for our work, we have received many awards, inter, international awards and Panhellenic awards in conferences. Uh, we get a distinction medal prize from Aristotle University uh, of the Saloniki. We have distinction of excellence from a Panhellenic Anesthesiology Conference. Uh, I had a grant from uh, Psychological Society of Northern Greece, and I, I get a, an, an Enialio legacy in memory of Lambros Enialis for my work in uh, cardiac surgery department. And now we'll speak about post-operative cognitive dysfunction, which is an impairment in attention, recognition, orientation, memory, and learning follow surgery. Results in increased morbidity and mortality, prolonged hospitalization, increased healthcare costs, and may have an adverse impact on social functioning and quality of life of cardiac surgery patients. Neuropsychometric tests are needed to detect and quantify subtle POCD, while its incidence depends on many things, for example, the type of surgery, the patient's age, among others. And coronary artery bypass grafting is a surgical procedure for the treatment of coronary artery disease. Provides complete revascularization, has low mortality rate, but has side, important side effects 
such as permanent vascular cerebral stroke, systemic inflammation, renal and pulmonary complications, and all these have adverse impact on cognitive functions. Now, about coronary artery bypass graft grafting. What is the research is showing? We had this publication, it was our first publication, along with cardiac surgeons and anesthesiologists. We examined the important issues regarding cardiac surgery patients. And this is our latest publication regarding the protective factors uh, when we, we are talking about the heart and brain and their dynamic connections. Uh, it's uh, the latest uh, in press uh, publication. And our hypothesis was that we wanted to see whether patients undergone coronary artery bypass grafting with the MEX system exhibited post-operative cognitive decline to a lesser extent than patients undergone coronary artery bypass grafting with a conventional old system. Uh, we had 60 patients, 29 operated on MEEC and 30 uh, operated on uh, KEC, tested before surgery prior to, di to discharge at a, a three-month follow-up. We used alternative forms of tests and we had an assessment of anxiety, depression, positive and negative mood. This is the MEEC system, the system that is innovative, the new system. Uh, this is a new technology and it's called a revolution technology uh, in cardiac surgery. And this is the neurocognitive test battery that we have used. Uh, we had a broad assessment of uh, cognitive functions uh, along with depression, positive and negative mood and anxiety. And this is the performance of our patient tested three times. As we can see, the performance uh, comes from the same baseline. And the performance in memory, we had in a MEAC group, we have a slight decrease of the performance, as well as uh, the CAC the group had uh, an increased uh, drop in the performance, while at uh, three months follow up, the performance is increased in one group and is stable uh, in other group. The same pattern can be found in attention as well. We had here in the MEAC group, we see an almost identical uh, performance uh, regarding uh, attention in comparison to the pre-surgical level. And uh, three months after surgery, we have an increased performance, while in the CAC group, we have a drop, a decreased performance, and then a slight improved performance in attention. Uh, executive function in executive functions, we see that the performance before surgery, the performance of both groups is um, different. We have almost the same uh, one uh, one uh, week after surgery and uh, increased performance four months after surgery, while the other group, the CAC group, had a slight decrease in the performance and three months after surgery, the performance is rising, but not to a big extent. And post-operative cognitive dysfunction in these two groups, uh, the MEA group, uh, the patient showed uh, a dysfunction uh, prior to, dis to discharge, 41% of patients uh, had declined prior to this charge, while 21% of patients so declined three months after surgery. And in CAC group, uh, the, the conventional system group, 65% of patients had declined prior to this charge, and 71% of patients had declined three months after surgery. And our conclusions about these two groups of patients where that the follow-up performance of MEEC group shows that they showed in increased uh, levels of preoperative uh, performance, uh, less overall postoperative cognitive dysfunction in these patients. And in CAC group, this group didn't reach preoperative neurocognitive levels immediately and three months after surgery. That shows that cognitive decline is uh, a factor on most 
neuropsychological domains is evident in most neuropsychological domains. And in these gru two groups, our findings suggested that the use of MEAG systems may be beneficial for the neurocognitive and emotional outcome of the patients. And cognitive and emotional stability plays a very important role in quality of life and, and daily activities and performance in general, especially in heart surgery elderly patients. And now another uh, diagnostic category, left ventricular assist devices patients, uh, patients with heart failure. And what is heart failure? We have dysfunction of the heart muscle and has previously been associated with neurocognitive deficits among others. The context here is that cardiac surgery has a common psychological thread and the individual's experience of life will never again return to the pre-illness sense of self, of options, of invulnerability, of obviousness to the body's uh, functioning. And cardiac surgery has important psychological and social consequences that demand significant psychological adjustment. The left ventricular assist device used successfully in treating patients with heart failure as a bridge to transplant and as destination therapy. LVADs and stem cells is worldwide innovation in heart surgery and has contacted, was contacted at a HEPA University Hospital for the first time, affiliated with Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. This procedure in net stage ischemic heart failure enhances myocardial reperf reperfusion. And this is the LVADs. The LVADs is a mechanism that is implanted inside the heart of the uh, patient. And these are the batteries uh, connected to the machine, the batteries that uh, the patient has to carry uh, with, uh, with them all the time. And the stem cells injection is that is intramyocardially injected into the heart. And this is very important. And this is very important technique because it, it somehow revives the heart of the patient. We had a patient, I, uh, I am a 64 year old right handed male with nine years of education. This patient had end stage ischemic cardiomyopathy, undergoing LVAD and stem cell implant, underwent a comprehensive neuro neuropsychological and emotional assessment, and we had concurrent counseling sessions with the patient and their family members. And we had an assessment before surgery, one month, six months, and 12 months after surgery. We used alternative forms of neuropsychological tests, and we had assessment of anxiety, depression, positive and negative mood, as well as quality of life, as performance on neuropsychological tests may be influenced by a patient's mood state. This is the neurocognitive battery that we have used. As, we can, as you can see, we had a broad assessment of neurocognitive functions and uh, positive negative mood, anxiety, depression, and quality of life of this patient. And the results, our results showed that patient's performance was in the average range with no evidence of decline on the three follow-up evaluations on executive functions, visual spatial perception, visual organization, attention, picture naming, working memory, mood scales, and quality of life. This means that post-operative cognitive decline at one month and six months after surgery of this patient reversed over time, and overall improvements for, from follow-up at one month to follow-up at six months occurred on 50% of the variables examined and patient's performance returned to the average and high average rates at 12 months after surgery. We had some recommendations for this patient that is very important to follow in other uh, case studies as well with the same uh, disorder. 
cognitive rehabilitation program plays a very important role here in these patients and programs are usually focused on specific difficulties to develop new strategies for daily activities. We had psychoeducation for patients and their family members. We had management of negative emotion regarding the device noise because this device that is implanted in the heart of the patient has a noise and the patient must live with noise uh, almost all, uh, all uh, their life. And we have psychological counseling for patient and family together or separately. And our conclusions about this uh, type of disorder, we say that emotions can overwhelm our brains, our hearts and our bodies, and they travel our emotional highway between our hearts and our minds in a bit, the connection undeniable, but sometimes it's difficult to measure. And so this is the reason that some researchers come to different conclusions because of the measurement. And the important key points here is that there are many counseling sessions before surgery and concurrent sessions with patients and their family members. And this is very important because counseling facilitates neuropsychological assessment and play a very important role when we talk about cardiac surgery clients and when we're, we're talking about cardiac surgery patients. And we don't forget psychologists and neuropsychologists contribution uh, in this uh, pay in this type of uh, patients, uh, psychologists and neuropsychologists play a very important role in the assessment and the rehabilitation part and delivering uh, counseling sessions in cardiac surgery uh, units and departments. And um, we conclude by rephrasing what Alan Butler had told about memory and we say that the best way to appreciate the importance of cognitive system is to consider what it could be like to live without it as cognitive system is not a single organ like the heart or liver but an alliance of systems that work together allowing us to learn from the past and predict the future. Thank you for your attention and thank you for, uh, get, for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present a very interesting topic. Uh, thank you, Calliope. It seems that we have some questions. So the first question from Helen is, is post-operative cognitive dysfunction specifically a problem relating to heart surgery or can other surgery have this effect? A uh, very important question, very interesting question. I didn't want to bring you so much detail regarding this, but yes, uh, cardiac surgery procedures are associated with a high percentage of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. The percentage is, is um, two times or three times more regarding to a general uh, surgery operation like other operations regarding other systems but not considering the brain. When we are talking about brain surgery, uh, the, the percentage of patients with post-operative cognitive impairment is uh, quite the same with cardiac surgery uh, procedures. So yes, cardiac surgery procedures have a huge amount of post-operative cognitive impairment. And there is also one more question from Eleana. Did the patient that had the surgery had any kind of cognitive skills training during the follow or afterwards? Yes, uh, the, the rehabilitation program, uh, the cognitive skills training uh, was part of rehabilitation program of this client. This client, this patient had cognitive training and uh, cardio rehabilitation has attended cardiac rehabilitation program after this period of time, meaning after one year. And we had assessment, uh, many, many assessment regarding this uh, patient and he had uh, increased the cognitive uh, uh, skills and cognitive function because of this um, training as well. There are many factors that consider to, to be helpful here. 
So yes, we had this after one year of surgery. Uh, sorry, we have one more question uh, from Nicola, which is, does the doctor know the works of John Kabat-Zinn? Uh, is, is, uh, is he a cardiac surgeon or a neuropsychologist? I don't, uh, his name does, he, or her name doesn't remind me something. I want to, I want to have more details about uh, this okay. research. Mm -hmm. Or if, uh, if uh, Nicola uh, can give us some more information, it would be very helpful for us. Because not many scientists uh, do neuropsychological assessment in cardiac surgery settings. So if this is uh, anyone that does, it would be very helpful for my research as well. Please explain the link between anxiety and Takotsubo type cardiomyopathy. Yes, uh, there is a link between this. Uh, usually patients uh, with cardiomyopathy have high, high levels of anxiety and, and depression and negative mood. That's why we conduct assessments and we conduct rehabilitation programs and uh, we conduct counseling skills and, uh, and counseling skills training. And uh, uh, we say that in psychotherapeutic interventions regarding these patients. So we have higher uh, levels of anxiety considering cardiomyopathy because cardiomyopathy is a condition uh, regarding to the patient and regarding to the type and the stage of uh, heart failure, because it leads to heart failure, it depends on the stage, of course, because there are four stages. And where the patient is in, on, four, on the fourth stage, I think it needs uh, to have uh, an operation because uh, they, they, could, they could not live without the operation. It's very important for their life. So they, they, they need the operation. Questions keep coming and that's really nice. So the next question is, does the cognitive impairment arise from surgical technique? For example, do different surgeons present different levels of impairment? Yes, this is a very good, a nice and interesting question. There are vast majority of researches about this post-operative cognitive impairment. Uh, post-operative cognitive impairment come, derives from many factors. It's anesthesia factors. It comes from uh, techniques uh, during the surgery. Uh, we cannot say that it's one factor, it's multifactorial. And uh, sometimes in the research, when you study in this field, you will see that many researchers say the opposite things. Many researchers may agree, they agree that it's a very important topic and it must be addressed, but they don't agree in some other issues. For example, they agree about the frequency, but they don't agree about the causes. And I, I have recently presented my postdoctoral research uh, about cardiac surgery and about protective factors uh, in cardiac surgery, about, uh, cardi uh, about uh, cognitive reserve and socioeconomic status uh, in childhood. And uh, uh, according to the, research, uh, the researches, uh, it's a multifactorial factor. Many factors play important role uh, in its cause, but we cannot blame only one or two. It's surgical factors. It has to do with patient's factor as well, meaning the age, the patient's age, the premorbid cognitive level. There are many factors contribute here. A question from Rick. Broken heart syndrome and the impact stress has on the heart. Broken heart symptom has impact both on... on on heart and brain as well. So it's very important that we consider that uh, many things derive from brain. So uh, broken heart syndrome, uh, many other cognitive factors play an important role here. And of course, it's a brain thing as well. And we have neurotransmitters in the brain addressing this issue, the, the broken heart syndrome. Why do you think MIECC seems to be beneficial 
relative to the CECC system. Yes, I'm glad that you are interested in our research. This was the topic on uh, many discussion and presentation regarding these uh, uh, patients. MEX systems is an innovative technology and is a new technology. Uh, of course, uh, the KEX system is the old, the conventional system. And cardiac surgeons say, say that many, there are many differences between these two systems and these differences regarding the technical parts for example, uh, with uh, the MEX system, the patient has uh, an increased uh, uh, level uh, inside uh, the surgical room. For example, fewer minutes of surgical operation. So this uh, fewer, the fewer minutes factor play an important role here. And of course, it's a new technology that is developing. So this is very important because we are talking about new technologies and new technologies are always welcome. And uh, we have uh, one, qu one more question from Eliana. Is cognitive rehabilitation more effective when patients are younger? Yes, of course. Uh, age play a very important role, but does, uh, that does not mean that uh, in the elderly, it's not helpful. Uh, it has to do with neuroplasticity as well. So, uh, and it has to do uh, with uh, the the things that the many other factors regarding the age, regarding comorbidity, regarding other factors that uh, physical illnesses as well. But uh, when we are talking about age, younger age contribute more positive when we are talking about rehabilitation programs. And the last question comes from Ayvid. Uh, does the heart send first the message to the brain? Are you aware of such a paper? I've heard of it, but wasn't able to locate it. There are many theories regarding this. There are the theories that, uh, that says that first is the heart uh, that sends the message, and that the theories that say that first is the brain, and it, in all, it's about brain issues. There are uh, two different theories. Of course, regarding the brain and the heart and regarding the brain and the emotions, uh, there are many theories that uh, uh, assume many things. Uh, but if you are talking about a specific paper that is published, I'm not, I'm not aware of it. If you can find it and send it to us, it could be very uh, useful. More questions just arrived. Uh, did your research take into account patients who followed a program of cardiac rehabilitation post-operatively and those that didn't? Ah, another interesting question. Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the second step of our research. This is the second step. The first step had to do with the assessment because we wanted to find things. And uh, you are very well know that... Uh, a, co a cognitive as neurocognitive assessment play a very important role when we are talking about neuro re rehabilitation programs. So the second stage of our research is a re is an ongoing research is about comparing the the patients that uh, are uh, in a neurocognitive rehabilitation program and the patients that are, are don't attend this program. So this is the second step of our research. We don't have any data yet. If we have, we will be very happy to present it to you. Uh, Calliope, if it's okay, one more question. Uh, does the presence of troponin in the blood have an effect on cognition? Um, of course, we cannot be uh, we cannot be be sure about many things. This doesn't have this is a thing that doesn't have to do with my expertise. Uh, because I am a neuropsychologist and I always, and I'm a clinical neuropsychologist and a counseling psychologist as well. But it's a very important issue to cooperate with medical doctors and uh, cooperate with other professionals. And this is a teamwork. I'm always saying that this is a teamwork. It's not only about us psychologists or them, medical doctors, it's a teamwork. So we we'll co we'll cooperate to each other and we explain some things uh, to each other. 
So when we come, uh, when we want to explain uh, troponin and things like that, I always uh, consult the the doctors and I always ask them about these issues. So uh, I see that you uh, is very, um, our research is of interest to you. So I'm glad because I consider it's a, a very specific research. I'm glad that you are interested. Uh, John says, I shall be very pleased to follow your research. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Thank you for attending. Thank you once more, Calliope. This was a, a, a very interesting presentation and the questions also from the audience were really nice. Uh, so thank you all for your contribution. We have one more question. <laughs> The questions are keep coming. <laughs> yes, uh, it's really nice uh, that we have so many questions. So uh, from Costanza, uh, she says, thank you for your for this presentation. I would like to know which is the quality of life standard aim in a procedure in cardiovascular insuffi insuff insufficient disease. We, we are talking about before surgery or after surgery. I suppose that we, we talk after surgery because uh, I was, uh, this was a, a, an issue in my presentation as well. I spoke about changing lives because this procedure changes the life of the patient. So a lot of things must be changed by the patient. And it's very important to have a stand a good standard of quality of life, meaning in everyday functioning, in everyday activities, everyday functioning. And when a patient is able to function in their everyday activities, usually this is the target. And the target is to be the quality of life because we compare the quality of life before surgery and the quality of life after surgery. The target is to be more close to pre-surgical uh, condition before surgery. Some, sometimes this cannot be happened. That's why we conduct uh, rehabilitation programs, neurocognitive and counseling uh, programs uh, regarding this. The quality of life standard is for the, uh, for the patient to function in a, a, a proper way. That's why we are talking about individualized approaches because each patient is different and each patient functions differently. And daily functioning, it's not the same thing for someone who underwent a cardiac surgery procedure, a professor uh, teaching in a university. It's, it's another thing uh, from, exa for example, a, a patient, a worker uh, working in industry that has to be back at work and has to do some things and some duties. So we use individualized approaches in order to assess quality of life. I don't see any more uh, questions in the Q&A uh, box. So let me double check. That was, I think, the last question from Costanza, the one you just answered. So this is the third time I'm going to, to thank everybody. Uh, Kayopi, thank you so much. It was a very nice uh, event, a very nice presentation. Thank you for hosting and uh, thank you for uh, uh, the rest of cooperation. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye, thank you for attending. <laughs>